Va Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamri Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaur Vali Pacharine Nirvasesa Sundyavari Pasyatya Dezutarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare on day, every year, the day preceding the appearance of Lord Nishringadev is the uh, celebration of the disappearance day of the only devotee that we know has been recognized as an official disappearance day in our Griskan society. That's when Srila Prabhupada was here. So Prabhupada designated this day as the day to honor a devotee named Jayananda Prabhu, who was one of the first devotees to join Srila Prabhupada back in 1967 in San Francisco. And uh, his history throughout his time in, in uh, ISKCON, Krishna Consciousness activities, is glorious from the time he started to the time he, he left his body in uh, May, First, 1977, just a few months before Srila Prabhupada disappeared. And uh, there's a beautiful letter written by Srila Prabhupada to Jayananda after his disappearance, where he writes in a very intimate and a very loving way how much he uh, was helped by Jayananda when Prabhupada started the movement. Um, in those days, he, he gave $5,000 to help print Prabhupada's Nectar Devotion. And $5,000 in 1977 is like $50,000 now. And that was a lot of money in those days. And that was a big help. And then, of course, uh, he was one of the first devotees to help maintain the early temples on the East Coast, especially San Francisco and Berkeley. And his history is really centered around the activities of Ratha Yantra. He designed and built the first Ratha Yantra carts in ISKCON, and uh, he was famous for doing that. And you'll see in every Ratha Yatra that we do, the lead car, there's a picture of Jayananda placed in the front just to honor his work, his service to um, Ratha Yatra. But it was more than his service. It was his service, yes, in a sense, but it was his nature. Um, he was different from the people who were joining at the time. The people who were coming to Prabhupada in those days were known as hippies, people who were more or less in that mode of rejecting everything and giving up all material connections and taking to a life of just like a vagabond, more or less. And But he was what we call a straight guy. <laughs> he grew up in a very nice middle-class family. And he was going to college. He had, he, in Ohio State, in Ohio, and he had gotten a degree in mechanical engineering. And, uh, but he never, but he, he worked as a cab driver. <laughs> Although he had that, uh, you know, Shastric uh, degree from the, from the university, and when he was asked, well, why are you working as a cab driver? You know, you can get a good job with your diploma. He said, I could never fit in with those people. <laughs> he didn't like the association because they were too materialistic. And he was really a person who was, as he described himself, very unhappy. Although he, had, he was good looking, very good looking, very sweet and gentle by nature very big, powerful person physically, coming from a good family, had money, at least from the family connections. But he was unhappy. In fact, he was almost suicidal. He didn't 
couldn't really uh, accept life the way it was. And, but then he, he saw an ad in a newspaper in the San Francisco Oracle, which described about a, one Swami who was coming to teach meditation. So he came. <laughs> And everybody else was, you know, with, you know, tie-dyed shirts and long hair, just coming down from some LSD trip or something. That was Prabhupada's earlier followers. <laughs> and, uh, but he was different and he came and when he, when he heard Prabhupada for the first time, he said, this is it, this is what I've been looking for. And he immediately, it wasn't a matter of, being cultivated, he immediately, immediately, as soon as he met Prabhupada, he understood this is where I want to be. And he came to Krishna consciousness. And in those days it was difficult because the devotees had no money. And there were no congregations to support our temples. So whatever money we were able to get, if somebody, if somebody was kind enough to give us a donation, like maybe when a devotee would join, we ask him, how much money do you have? <laughs> and please leave it all here, because we, <laughs> <'cause> we need it. <laughs> Malati tells the story how in San Francisco in the early days, when they had, they had rented this apartment and they were living there and holding small programs with the wherever hippies were coming, how Krishna helped the devotees get money when they always needed it. They never got more than what they needed, but they always got what they needed. So there was one incident where the temple was due to pay the rent for the month. And I don't know, it was like a couple hundred dollars for the rent for the month. They had no money and they were spending all whatever money they had uh, to, to live, <laughs> to get food. <laughs> And, uh, you know, in those days we had like some Back to Godhead magazines and so we go sell them on the street for 10 cents or 25 cents. If you got 50 cents, that was wow. That was good. So Malati tells this one story where her, her husband Sham Sundar, and the Guru Das, the three of them were walking down one street and they were discussing, well, tomorrow the rents is going to do. And everybody wanted an apartment in that area because it was a big hippie area and hippies were looking for places to, to live. So the landlords weren't tolerating anybody paying. You didn't pay your rent, you were out. <laughs> so they were, they were going to lose their point. So they were walking and they were thinking, what are we going to do? And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there was $100 bills flying in the air. <laughs> And they were just coming in the breeze, and there was nobody around. <laughs> so Malati describes how they started to pick up the hundred-dollar bills, <laughs> and then all of a sudden they had enough money. It was like that in the old days. We had to simply depend on Krishna. There was no, you know, like it's say, connected source of income. It was just Krishna save us. <laughs> we need some money <laughs> to keep going. And, but somehow Krishna always made it where we could get by somehow. But Jayananda, he, had, he gave $5,000 and that was, I mean, Prabhupada was looking for ways to print and he didn't have the, Prabhupada didn't have the money either and soon as, so Prabhupada was very grateful for that. And then when, Prabhupada, when he left, Prabhupada wrote this personal letter and says, you know, you have dedicated your life fully to devotional service and you have shown by your example how sincere you are. And he was glorifying his service in so many ways. And he said, now that you have left, um, um, Krishna has taken you back to the spiritual world. But if you had even a slight tinge of material desire, then you would go to the heavenly planets and you would stay there for 1,000 years and have much material opulence. And then you would come back to the earth planet and then you would uh, live in a very pious and religious family and take birth in a nice family. But then Prabhupada ended the letter, but I am sure that you went back to the spiritual world with Krishna. <laughs> 
And he, he, that letter is, is, you can read it. And uh, so Prabhupada gave him that recognition of being honored on this day, the day before Rathya, uh, before Nishringa Devi's appearance every year. Uh, how he uh, pleased Prabhupada with his service. Um, in those days, you know, they, nobody knew what they were doing. <laughs> we still, we still don't. <laughs> But it's a little better. <laughs> we have an idea now. Before we didn't have any ideas either. <laughs> so, um, and you know, like there was this new hippie who came into the temple. So they said you should work with Jayananda. So Jayananda was taking out the trash. <laughs> and he would collect the trash and organize it and then get rid of the trash. So they put this new boy with him. And after working with Jayananda, you know, he later he came. He said, "If if the trash man is like that, I can't imagine what the rest of the temple is." You know, because he was Jay, Jayananda was so nice. He was thinking, "Oh, the devotees must be even better. He's the trash guy." <laughs> but when Prabhupada would come to the temple, Jayananda would always be doing some service that was needed. <laughs> He would never like rush to see Prabhupada. And sometimes Prabhupada would say, Well, where's Jayananda? Well, he's out doing this, he's you know, he's collecting the trash or he's he's, he's doing some work in the temple. Prabhupada said, Bring him. <laughs> so then Prabhupada he would come and he would pay his obeisances and Prabhupada would just be so happy to see him. And Prabhupada would speak something and then he would say, Prabhupada, can I go? <laughs> Back to my <laughs> to my service, <laughs> and Prabhupada said, yes, of course. He just loved to do service. He was the last one to take rest at night and the first one and getting up in the morning. And sometimes devotees would come back late from book distribution, he would be amongst them. And then uh, and he would go, and then if he didn't finish his rounds for some reason, he would never take rest. So sometimes at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, he finished his rounds. But he would be up before everybody. They, they never saw him go to sleep and they never saw him get up. Because <laughs> he was always the last one to sleep and the first one up. <laughs> and he really put his heart into serving Prabhupada's mission. And in those days it was difficult because, you know, it was more like training people to do things. And, and most of the people, especially on the West Coast, they were mostly just, they thought Hare Krishna was really something to check out, and it was cool. You guys sing and dance real nice, and you got nice food. <laughs> but as far as taking us seriously philosophically, there was only a few people who did that. <laughs> and gradually, gradually. And, and Jayananda, he... He when when he would meet a new person, he would bring him in and he would give him prasadam, and he would fill up the plate so big that they would think what, <laughs> and he would say no no you have to eat it all. So there was one devotee. He later became a devotee. He ate his re the whole plate and he was like stuffed. And then he came with another plate the same size, second one, and he said. I can't eat that. And then Prabhupada said, you have to eat enough that you waddle. When you walk, you waddle like a duck, you know. <laughs> yeah, Prabhupada said that. For the first six months, you have to eat so much, so much that there's no escape, you know. Because Prabhupada's program was if you stuff yourself with prasadam for six months, you're guaranteed to be a devotee. <laughs> You know, the power of Prashadam. <laughs> yeah, so that was, you know, Jayananda was the person you'd get the Prashadam from. He loved Prashadam too. Sometimes he would, about 10 o'clock at night, he would call one of his friends and say, Hey, I got some uh, peanut butter halava. Come on, let's go. <laughs> And he would, he was, a, he was also known to consume large amounts, but he also, Loved to. I mean, he was always busy throughout the day, and he when he when he would get up in the morning, generally, unless he had some immediate service, he would go to Mangalarti, then chant all his sixteen rounds before he did anything, 
and read a little bit, then he would go out and start doing his service. And one of the services that he would go is to, he would go to the Italian markets and speak to the Italian grocers there and beg and see if they had any, any extra produce that they couldn't sell. And then sometimes they would give him a whole bunch and he would take it back and the devotees would use it for the Sunday feast. And he would sometimes bring, and then he would bring prasadam to these people too. He would always bring him prasadam. So he became really friendly with a lot of these these grocery men, and uh, they loved him. In fact, when they some of them when they heard that he left, they actually cried. Some of them they were like non devotees, and they when they heard that he actually left the world, they. Some of them were known to take the tears. And that, that's how much he touched the heart of everybody. He was so kind, so hardworking, so kind. And if anybody praised him and he was around, you could expect that he'd be gone as soon as you started. Never liked the devotees praising him. He would just immediately... And the other way, too, if he found anyone speaking bad about any devotee, he would immediately leave. He wouldn't... And then the devotee would get, oh, yes, we're speaking. John and Jayananda's leaving that mess means we're spoke, speaking wrongly here. Because they respected him because he started Rathiatra. He designed the first Rathiatra car because he was a mechanical engineer and so he knew how to do all that. And then he started building the carts himself using, sometimes he would use the non devotees to help. He would be building the carts in the streets and he would see people walking along. He said, you want to do some service for God? And they would say, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, come, come and help us build this cart. And they would come and stop. And he was like that. He could pull people off the streets and just ask them to help serve and they would immediately. They, there was a, he had this kind of, what they call it, he was affable, very affable, very... Uh, he could speak to people so easily and naturally that never, no one ever felt like he was imposing on them when he spoke. He was just so personal and so, so friendly. He was like your friend when he, when he talked to you. And when it came to giving classes, he never wanted to give classes. He was always thinking, I can't give class. But sometimes they would force him to give a class. And when he gave a class, everyone would say, my God, what a class that was. He knew the philosophy so well, but he, uh, he understood that philosophy means service. <laughs> and this is, but this is the real philosophy. So he, he stayed engaged from the time he got up to the time he took rest at night. Always busy. And then there was one story when he was, he would also be fixing cars. The devotees had, had cars would break down. There's one story where 11 o'clock at night he was underneath a car fixing a car and two guys were walking along. He noticed them and he started talking to them while he was fixing the car and he was preaching to them and all they could see was his legs sticking out from underneath the car <laughs> while he was fixing the car. And he would talk to them about Krishna consciousness. Uh, he's, he was just like uh, amazing. And I met devotees who had become devotees because of him. I never had the good fortune of meeting him because I was always on the other side. I was on the East Coast and he was always on the West Coast. So I never met him personally, but we used to always hear, you know, the stories of how he... And uh, so many wonderful personal stories of how he served Prabhupada. In 1976, Prabhupada wanted to have the Rathiyatra in New York City. And Prabhupada said, I, have, I want to conquer New York City. New York City is the biggest city in the world, most important. Let's, we're going to have, we're going to bring Jagannath. And so the devotees were able to convince the authorities in New York to give us a Rathiyatra route, which was Fifth Avenue, which is the most popular street in, uh, in New York. It's huge, it goes for miles. And every year, from 59th Street all the way down to, uh, let's see, 
Cent- not Central Park, but what is that? Thompson Square Park? No. There's another park. I can't think of the name. Miles and miles we would do the Rath Theatre. In 1976, Prabhupada, really, he, he was looking forward to this Rath Theatre. So Jayananda was organizing the buildings of the carts. And you want to know why Donald Trump became president? I could tell you why. I mean, you know, it's a very uh, Gupta story. <laughs> it's very secret. Because we had no place in New York to build the carts. There was nobody who was going to, and everything was, you know, was city property. We couldn't get any place, and the bodies were running around. Finally, Donald Trump lended us, gave us his personal area. There was a, like a, a place that he owned, and he said he gave us that place to build the carts. That's why he became president. <laughs> well, you know, maybe people will argue with that, but anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, and then uh, when we, we were building the carts, devotee, this is a beautiful story. When I was in London a few years ago, one devotee came to the temple who was there during this time. He told the whole story, and it was an amazing story. And the devotees had finished the carts at 10 o'clock in the evening, the day before the Rath Yantra. And the, the next day, at 10 a.m., the carts were meant to roll down Fifth Avenue. But as soon as we finished, something happened. A huge wind came off the Hudson River in New York and just hit the canopy of Balaram's cart and knocked it over, the whole cart, huge cart, and smashed the cart. The cart was unusable. It, it was destroyed. And now, you know, what to do at 10 o'clock at night and everyone was tired from working the whole day and Jayananda said no we're gonna we're gonna fix this cart but then again some of the parts they needed they had already discarded and didn't know where they were or they couldn't they didn't even have the parts but devotees worked hard under his care and finally they came up with some of the parts and found them and built that cart and stayed up all night, the whole night, building the rebuilding jug in it. Because somebody said, well, we'll just have two carts. But then Jayananda said, no, Prabhupada wants three carts. <laughs> we must have three carts. So that cart was finished just in time for the Ratha Yajra the next day. It's an amazing story. Uh, there's, I have it all... Uh, documented where devotees are, gave, I mean, it was an amazing story how they built that car. It was impossible to build because even the, the parts weren't even there. But they did it. Jai Sisi Pan Gornitai Ki Jai. And, uh, yeah, and then when I finished, they told Prabhupada the story. Prabhupada was so happy. And then we had that Rathi Archer. Prabhupada said, I've con- I conquered New York. <laughs> My mother, she went to that Rathi Archer, and that was, I think, the only one she ever went to. She remembers. She said, oh, that was so nice. <laughs> that was so nice. Yeah, so that was Jayananda. And so, so many wonderful stories of his life. I didn't get a chance to uh, review his life, but um, this is what I remember. But I can tell one really interesting story. Everyone knew Jayananda as someone who was very surrendered, very devoted, very friendly, and very intelligent in how to get things done. So I have one disciple, in fact, she was my first disciple ever when I took up the position of spiritual master. That was in 2006. Her name is Kalindi. She's in America. And she's a hospice worker. She works with pe- people who are, you know, dying. 
So one day she told me that she met some lady and she somehow or other found out that this lady was the mother of Jayananda. Interesting. And then when she found out, she started to glorify Jayananda to, her, to his mother. <laughs> and, and then, of course, she took care of her until she actually left the world. When her, others, her daughter heard about it, her and her husband came to Kalindi and said, please come, we want to have a, a uh, ceremony for the departure of my mother. We want you to speak about my brother, or my brother-in-law, Jayananda. So she came and spoke and started to glorify. And then the most amazing thing is, and this is the thing that's really the heart of this story, is that Krishna took care of his mother by allowing a devotee to be that person who took her to the last part of her life. How Krishna worked in such a way as to show special mercy to his mother through this devotee who just happened to be there as, as a hospice worker. And then she, Kalindi wrote the whole thing up in an in a explanation document, which I have, in describing how she spoke and how the family reacted, how much they appreciated their, for being there, how much they learned about their brother and brother-in-law, and how much the mother also was so happy to hear, hear somebody that knows all about my son, <laughs> who had left much earlier, you know. So I think the mother left in 2008 or something like that. Yeah, it was a nice story. Um, so these are a few of the many, many, there's a book about the life of Jayananda that was written in ISKCON which describes many, many personal stories of his life with, in Krishna consciousness. When he was in the hospital and he was sick, you know, they, they tried to put him on a special diet, but he, when the devotees would come, he would say, did you bring me any prasadam from the temple? And they say, yeah, we got some halava, we got some garanga potatoes. They say, yeah, this, this, is, this is a real medicine. <laughs> so he, 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 he always honored Prashadam to the very end. <laughs> he loved Prashadam. But he became a devotee who really was known as making Rathayachar what it was. He really served Prabhupada nicely by creating those Rathayachar cards and developing the whole program around Rathayatra, which Prabhupada really, really wanted for preaching in the West. These are just a few of his many, many wonderful episodes in his life. He, he died of leukemia, um, and he, it's interesting, he died at 4.30 in the morning Soon as the conch shell blew for Mongol Arti, he left his body. <laughs> Soon as the conch shell blew, exactly, he, he departed the, the world right at that same time. But Krishna wanted to show the glory of this person in so many ways. This is a little bit about Jayan. So today is his disappearance day. So if you are, want to find out more, the book is by one god brother. His name is Vishok. And he wrote um, a st the whole life of Jayananda in the form of a book. It's called Jayananda. And then there's Danishta. Danishta is another god sister. And she also wrote more like unpublished material of the life of Jayananda. Okay, that's as much as I can remember. I did know one devotee who was made... This devotee was a real hippie. I mean, he was like the first clay. He hadn't bathed in one month. He hadn't taken a bath in one month. 
So you can imagine, you know, they could have created a new kind of perfume from him. <laughs> One full month. So, Jaya, you know, nobody would go near him, but Jayananda didn't care. And so when he took him in, the first thing he did is threw him in the shower <laughs> and scrubbed him down. <laughs> I think there was a few thousand other living entities that disappeared along with the dirt. <laughs> because it was, it was fashionable. Not to bathe, if you were a hippie, one of the things you, you know, you, you were, to take a bath was against the hippie rules, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and growing up in America was like that. You know, I mean, when I was growing up in the kid, as a kid, you know, bath was Saturday night, once a week. <laughs> And I would think, oh no, I got to go through this. <laughs> so I, I would take a wash rag and that's it. <laughs> so, you know, this is what it was like in Western countries. And, and nobody, I don't know, for some reason people didn't like to use water or something. <laughs> I don't know what it was. It's, it's something about life in the West. <laughs> I think it's changed a little. <laughs> so, yeah. And so he would deal with people like that that were nobody would go near. And, and he would just bring them in, give them prashadam, throw them in the shower, <laughs> and then give them a, a nice set of, you know, devotional clothes. Start them off on their Krishna consciousness. That was Jayananda. Very kind. He, he, very, very kind. And whatever money he had, he gave to the he gave to Prabhupada, to the temple. He supported. He was he was the temple president at one time, and he was the, the person who was supporting at the temple at the same time. He would drive a cab, and whatever money he would make from the cab, he would give it to the temple, and then he would manage the temple too. <laughs> That was Jayananda. So he's one of the devotees that we remember in the early days of one who sacrificed completely for Prabhupada's movement. No personal concern, only he wanted to serve Prabhupada. And when he would talk about Prabhupada, he could talk about Prabhupada all day. He would just glorify. He loved Prabhupada. And anything, he, when he would speak, give a lecture, he would just simply repeat Prabhupada, that's all. He didn't have time to read books because he was always too busy, but he would sometimes listen to Prabhupada's lectures. He would memorize Prabhupada's lectures and then when he, sometimes they would ask him to speak or when sometimes he'd be speaking, he'd always speak about how, how wonderful Prabhupada is, how Prabhupada came and sa saving everybody, how, how wonderful Krishna is how dear Prabhupada is to Krishna. He would always speak simple, simple but deep. Deep because he spoke from the heart. He didn't have a lot of Shastric knowledge, but he, he, was, he had that bhakti that was really strong. And the, I remember the, the marketplace was people, that, they couldn't say Jayananda, so they would call him Jani Ananda. Because Johnny is a, like an English name. They call him Johnny Ananda. <laughs> yeah. But he loved Prashad. Oh, really loved it. And in those days, the Prashad, I mean, nowadays, the Prashad we get here. It's nice, but it's not like the old days. You know, push pond rice. Um, you don't know that one? Push pond rice? Hmm. Well, it has saffron in it. Yeah, yeah with cashews. 
uh, garunga potatoes with a lot of sour cream, <laughs> halava which mo with more butter than grains, <laughs> um, pakoras, especially cauliflower pakoras, samosas. Uh, what is that one thing? Uh, it's a sweet. Yeah, oh yeah, gloves and buns. They were, we used to call them Iskan bullets. <laughs> and uh, what is that one? It's like a, you soak it in like, in condensed milk, but it's like a patty. Huh? No? Uh, no? <laughs> uh, we saw it at feast sometimes, and sometimes they put s s saffron in it. It's, it's like a dough patty. No, it's. Mm, oh, I can't remember. <laughs> But it, and we would, you know, that was, I mean, it was really rich. Every feast had sweet rice. If you didn't have a feast without, if you had a feast without sweet rice, nobody would come. <laughs> sweet, <laughs> ri <laughs> sweet rice, halava, halava, halava and sweet rice had to be there. Poris, you know what chapuris are? No, chapuris. This is an Iskan creation. <laughs> half white flour and half whole wheat flour. And so instead of poris, we call them chapuris. <laughs> and balarams, you know what balarams are? In, when, with powdered sugar on the outside. It's like a pori with powdered sugar on the outside, real thick. So these were our feasts. I mean, no, we didn't eat like, you know, just like dal and rice. And <laughs> that was like, a, oh man, we don't, that's, you know, this was, food was exciting in those days. Uh, what, <laughs> what was it? Um, uh, that, uh, kofta. Kofta with tamarind chutney and uh, breadsticks. <laughs> Made with, uh, you know, uh, with sesame or caraway seeds. <laughs> I'm trying to think of that one prep. I'll get it. It'll come. Uh, these were like a regular food every day. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> the feast was even more so. And, uh, I mean, not, not in, not in New Vrindavan, but in the rest of this <laughs> I was in New Vrindavan. Um, getting close. Yeah, these were, this is the stuff we would eat, eat. And so everything was like floating in cream, milk products, ghee. And, and devotees would eat a big feast and then they, they would be out cold for like half a day, you know. <laughs> Samosas and kachuris and poris. Then we tried to make rubbery one time. You know, rubbery? Yeah, we couldn't do it. We, we failed. <laughs> I tried. I was a cook for many years. Yeah, I was the, nobody liked what I made. <laughs> I couldn't cook. Because <laughs> I was kind of like a little strict on. Huh? Nuvrindavan was a whole different thing. Nuvrindavan was austerity personified, <laughs> so everything was austere there. But the, the Maha was super because we had so many cows, <clears throat> and so we, would have, we had fresh milk from the cows, and that night, every night we had popcorn and fresh milk, and the devotees would have these huge bowls. We'd fill them up with hot milk, be like a liter of milk every <laughs> and then the whole community got sick <laughs> and from eating too much milk milk and Prabhupada came and Prabhupada said 
you're taking too much milk. <laughs> and then he gave his famous statement, only one pound of milk per addicts per day and no more than one pound and no less than one half pound. So if you break it into ounces, I don't know how, liters and milliliters, I can't think in because I, I was trained in ounces. So 17.2 ounces is a pound and, and half of that is a half pound. Then Prabhupada said, that means all milk products. <laughs> so you have to add it up. That means your burfi, your sweet rice, your yogurt, your milk, your rubbery, your koa, your para. <laughs> like that. I'm still trying to think of that in preparation. And we used to put some some saffron in this one preparation too. It's really a nice it's like a it's like kinda like a spongy patty. No. It's flat. It looks like a, a patty. And you fl you put it in condensed milk. We call it rasmalai, this type of dish. No, rasmalai is a little different. This is not made from milk, but it's soaked in milk. Mm, I can't think. <laughs> hmm? Is some, some variety like Italy? Well, Italy is, Italy is more like a salty pepper. This was completely sweet. It was, used to be a favorite of everybody. We'd try to eat as much as we could. We had one devotee at the farm, his name was, we called him the Prashadam Addict. <laughs> yeah, and he wrote, actually he wrote a book which calls, was called Confessions of a Prashadam Addict. And I have the copy, it's a 32 page book. And he would do anything for Prashadam. He worked hard, but he loved Prashadam. And one time he ate two gallons of sweet rice and another time, 70 chapatis, 7-0. Seven <laughs> and he would, he would always try to figure out how to steal prashadam. Because in those days, in New Vrindavan, prashadam was only available at times, at the breakfast, lunch, and evening. No, evening was just popcorn and milk. And everything was austere, so we would put the maha in the maha cabinets, and then that would be distributed for the breakfast. For, and if you're there, you get it. If you weren't there, you missed it. <laughs> and everybody would get a little bit of maha. But those who would manage the maha, they would steal most of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so after a while, devotees thought, well, maybe... Um, Maybe it, uh, we should, you know, have more maha. And so there was a plan. And we used to keep it in a cabinet with a padlock on it. But the door, if you were strong enough, you could pull the bottom part of the door up and stick your hand inside. <laughs> and so devotees were stealing maha like that. And then everybody was wondering, why is it such a little maha at breakfast? You know, we, we offer much more than that. And then it was found out people were stealing it. So, so then they decided to do something different. And they put nails on the inside, so if you stick your hand in there, it was like Agasura, you know. But that didn't stop it. <laughs> so, so they continued to steal. And then, then, the, then we got really strict. So here, we, then there was a penalty imposed. You want to hear the penalty? If you were caught stealing maha. The punishment is you had to get married. <laughs> that was the punishment. <laughs> and it was also good because most of the men didn't want to get married and all the ladies did. So, <laughs> so it kind of served a purpose there. <laughs> so if you were caught stealing maha, the punishment was married. So every week there would be like three or four marriages on Sunday. <laughs> But the, the, the thievery kept going on, and there was one devotee, he wanted to get married, but nobody wanted to marry him. 
So he decided to keep stealing Maha and get caught so he could get married. <laughs> but every time they would catch him, they knew that his program was to get married, so they wouldn't give him any wife. <laughs> so then they, he kept doing it, so they thought, well, there's one lady that nobody will marry. <laughs> nobody, she, nobody could go near her because she was like, you know, like Putana, you know. <laughs> So, in order to satisfy her, they, they said, all right. So next time he got caught, they said, this is your wife. <laughs> and he married her. He did. And then I was in Chicago in the beginning of this century, around 1999, 2000. She came. She came to see me. She came to the temple and she ha I happened to meet her. She remembered me. She said, boy, everybody, nobody in New Vrindavan was nice to me except Radhanath Swami. <laughs> he was always nice to everybody. But nobody would go near her because she was like, you know. <laughs> so, and, so, and so she had her daughter with her. And that was the, fa he was the father. So I asked, what happened to the father? He, she said, he's gone. <laughs> he took off, he never came back. So every week there was marriages, and so, but it still didn't break the cycle of stealing the maha. So then they decided to get a refrigerator and put a, lo a chain lock around it. And so they put chains around the refrigerator with a padlock on the outside. But that didn't stop. Devotees were sawing the lock off, and <laughs> so then stealing it. So finally... Um, they uh, got this real big refrigerator and put some chains around it. And then uh, one day they came and the, the refrigerator was gone. <laughs> Somebody had stolen the whole refrigerator. <laughs> and we were, we, were, we, were in, we were a construction, you know, we used to do a lot of construction, so we had dynamite there for using it, for blowing up mountains so we could continue our excavation. So they took dynamite and they blew up, opened the refrigerator with the dynamite so they could get inside and get, get the maha. This is true stories, I'm sure. And so every week there was a marriage. <laughs> I got caught, I had to get married. I was married for a day. <laughs> Just one day, that was all. They gave, they gave me this lady, I don't even know who, who it was. I, I met her on my day of the marriage. And they said, this is your wife. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> and then they sent her out on Sankirtan the next day, and I never saw her again. <laughs> and two years later, they said, they said to me, do you still want to be married? I said, no. <laughs> so I was like a guy, a husband without a wife. <laughs> These are all true stories. You, you don't know what it was like in the old days of Krishna consciousness. <laughs> you know, trying to plant, plant this Indian culture into a Western hippie culture was <laughs> quite difficult. <laughs> Somehow we survived, though, some of us. Yeah, I like that. So. But, And this is the, the old days of New Vrindavan. But Prashadam was so nice. I mean, the deities got the first class offerings, but the devotees were eating simple, <laughs> except for Sunday feast. And everyone wanted to volunteer to be the server on Sunday feast, because if you were the server, you would control the whole, all the Prashadam. And so before you would serve it out, all the all the servers would take half of it and hide it. And then they would go out and serve what's left. And then when they would run out, everybody would say, well, is that all there is? Yeah, that's all there is. And then they would catch the servers eating it in the back there. <laughs> so it was an adventure because this was New Vrindavan. I think it's city temples were a lot different. New Vrindavan was really austere. Yes, uh, Matsya, you want to say something? 
there's also a story with uh, Jananda Prabhu um, and devotees heading to prison with Prasad. Well, there's one story where they they are on their way to one prison with a whole bunch of prasadam. They had uh, ladus and halava and puris. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a legitimate excuse. Okay. These are some old New Vrindavan stories. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of them that would make your hair stand on end. <laughs> I'll tell you one Prabhupada story. Um, one lady, she joined the Hare Krishna movement and she hated men. She was a man-hater, really hated men. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow or other she liked, she liked Krishna anyway. But after, and she just joined anyway. And then one day she came to Prabhupada, she said, I just can't serve that man, Krishna. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, no problem, Radharani's higher. <laughs> Radharani's better. <laughs> and she said, oh, okay. <laughs> so Prabhupada knew how to take care of these things. I mean, we had a lot of problems like that. One time, you know, we, people would be gay and they would come and we would say, write to Prabhupada, this guy's gay, what, what, where should we put him, with the men or with the women? You know? <laughs> because he's with the men, it's dangerous, and if he's with the women, it kind of doesn't fit the gender, you know? <laughs> so Prabhupada said, choose one of the two, but make sure he doesn't change. <laughs> now Prabhupada solved the problems. <laughs> These were the old days. I mean, some of the wild, wildest stories. I almost remember that preparation again. <laughs> it's getting close. <laughs> huh? It's made out of white flour, and it, it looks brown. And then you soak it. I think you fry it in ghee, and then you soak it in... Hmm? Malpur, Malpur, okay, Malpura, yeah, yeah, and that was really a favorite, Malpura. Oh, that was so nice. You know how? Make huh? Cha cha. Don't don't give me any because I can't eat it. <laughs> Malpur, yeah, that was a favorite for everybody. If there wasn't a feast without Malpur, then it was just like everybody would complain. Where's the Malpur? <laughs> yeah, push pond rice. And that was always there, and uh, halava, sweet rice, um, sim and then, then simply wonderfuls came in. Somebody created it, and when Prabhupada ate it, he said, oh, this is simply wonderful, and they gave it the name. <laughs> it was just powdered sugar and powdered milk, that's all. They rolled together in a ball. And sometimes they put a raisin in there, <laughs> and that was that was simply wonderful. Yeah, these were some of the other. I'll tell one more Prabhupada story. This is a recent one. One devotee was out distributing books, and he was a new devotee. He just joined the temple, and he told him, "Your first service is go out book distribution." <laughs> they didn't know so much. So he's out distributing the books and he hands this one book to this one man. So the man looks at it and turns on the other side and he sees a picture of Prabhupada. And it says, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So the man turns to the boy and he says, what does A.C. mean? And the man, the boy said, always cool. <laughs> 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 and you know the guy liked it he thought it was pretty good 
kind of fits too. <laughs> he didn't really know. He just took a took a good guess, you know. <laughs> and these are some of the crazy Iskon stories. <laughs> um, what we did in the early days, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it's the same movement. <laughs> It's just wild. Uh, I, when I, I used to cook, <laughs> I laughed because, you know, I, nobody liked my cooking at all. It was terrible. Because <laughs> I was, I had this philosophy, and I was cooking, I was in the Brahmachari Ashram, which is Brahmachari, said so. We had three, three farms and one was Brahmachari. So we would get government surplus food items that we could get free because we were non-profit. So they would give us peanuts and oats. So I had this frying pan that was about this big. The pan was about this big with a long handle. And it had all dents in it. <laughs> and we cooked on wood. We cooked on wooden stove, no gas. And wood is nice. Have you cooked on wood before? No? Yeah, cooking on wood is nice. So I used to put the frying pan on top of the wood stove, and I'd throw the oats in, and I would try to toss it. But because the pan was full, full of bumps, it'd stick, and it'd get little black marks. Everybody thought they were raisins. <laughs> but they weren't. It was just burnt, burnt oats. That's all it was. And so I used to throw peanuts in, and I would count how many brahmacharis in the ashram. And then I would multiply that by eight, and, and I would give every brahmachari could only have eight peanuts. <laughs> because, you know, peanuts are, are high protein, and protein causes you to, go, to become agitated, and so and that's not good for brahmacharis. <laughs> so everyone was complaining, it's, you know, like Chandramali, he get them out of the kitchen, you know. <laughs> but they couldn't because nobody else would go in there. <laughs> they used to call the, the kitchen the dungeon. It was in the basement. It had no windows. <laughs> and they would look to find me, and they'd look in the kitchen and see if I was there. And I was there. They couldn't see me <laughs> because there was so much smoke <laughs> from the wood. <laughs> Because they would bring the wood in, and they would just give it to me wet, and then I'd have to dry it out. And drying it out means the whole place would be up in smoke. So, one, so after doing that, I lost my eyesight. I couldn't see, because my eyes got burnt out from the smoke. So I met my first Ayurvedic doctor ever in my whole life. They found this Indian man. He came and he said, no problem. <laughs> And he, gave, he took honey, ordinary honey, he mixed it with warm water, and he said, you put it on your eyes, you close your eyes for a half hour, two, three times a day. And that's what I did, and a couple of days later, maybe about a week later, my eyes were, were, were back. Yeah, just honey and water. So, because I used to try to do RT and I couldn't see the deities, so it would be like this. Because they have an, a chandelier hanging in the middle, and it was bright, so it would make my, I would be blinded. I thought it was, I had reached Brahmani realization. <laughs> but it was just the light from the chandelier. <laughs> so that's what it was like. So then there was like a revolution amongst the brahmacharis for more peanuts. So they, they got together as a group and you know, threatened me, so. And then Radhanath Swami, who was there, I was, he was the pujari and I was the cook, so he said, you know, you're gonna have to increase the peanuts. <laughs> so I went from eight to 13 per person. <laughs> but that was it, I wasn't gonna go any farther under any influence or threat or anything. So I went up to 13, and when, you know, that was my limit. <laughs> And the devotees would eat just oats and peanuts, and it was partially burnt, and the other part, part was raw, half raw and half burnt oats. 
because we were always in a hurry. <laughs> and then we'd give, we'd have hot milk and, and raw oats in the morning with some peanuts. And the persons who got there first, they would sometimes go through the prasadam and pick out the peanuts. <laughs> So some people wouldn't even get their <laughs> allotted quota. <laughs> it was a peanut fight, you know. Uh, that's, that's what it was like. So then Prabhupada was about to come so that anybody who could cook would have to cook for Prabhupada. So I had mastered pera. I was, a, I was known as the pera, uh, pera, what is it? Devotee. <laughs> And I could, so they said, you make para for Prabhupada. So I said, all right. But I wanted to go see Prabhupada when he came at the airport, but they were only choosing certain people, and I had the job of cooking. I was the head cook, but I was the only cook. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good. I was in the position of complete control. <laughs> so... so I wanted to see Prabhupada, so I was just like cooking, I was cooking this pear for Prabhupada. And uh, I was cooking, and I was practically crying, <laughs> because I wanted to go see Prabhupada, and I could. And when I was, in, I wasn't paying attention so much to the cooking, <laughs> so the pear came out all sticky and gooey and hard, and was like brown, real dark. So, uh, I, after I finished, I looked at it and I said, I can't give this to Prabhupada. Then I had some real nice ones that I had made for the deities. So I said, all right, I'll give those to Prabhupada. And then when the devotees came around to look for the prasadam to bring to Prabhupada, I wasn't in the kitchen. But Radhanath Maharaj, he was Brahmachari also at the time. So he came and looked for the, and he found the one I actually cooked the dark ones. And he said, all right, let's take them. So they gave them to the devotees to take to the airport. <laughs> and when I found out, I was thinking, you know, suicide is only the only recourse. <laughs> it's, it was so bad. I was feeling terrible. But then the next day, Kirtananda Swami, who was the temple leader, he said, he said to me, he said, Chandramali, I saw Prabhupada do something I never saw him do before. Because he had a lot of time, what he said. He ate three of your para, one after another. <laughs> uh, he liked it for some reason. And then Rana Swami told me later, he said, You know, you always thought para meant light, but para meant dark. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I didn't know that. Because <laughs> I used to make these real light colored ones. And I thought they were, you know, the, the kind that you're supposed to make. So when it came out all dark and chewy, it was like, it was like, you know, if you chewed on it, I think, you know, Prabhupada was transcendental to what I made, but he liked it for some reason. Yes? Maharaj, can you explain what this para is? You don't know what para is? Well, it's milk. Let me see, ladies can correct me because I'm not so expert. It's milk, and then you cook it, you milk and sugar put together with cardamom seeds. You crush the cardamom seeds and you add it to it and you cook it down. And then when it's done, you shape it into a cookie, cookie form, and then you roll it in sugar. So it has sugar on the outside, cardamom on the inside, and it's milk and sugar, like that. That's called, that's right? Correct? Yeah, it has the cardamom flavor, which makes it unique. It's not para, it's pita. <laughs> pita. <laughs> yeah, like that. So, yeah. So, yeah. But when I, and they, I don't know, I wasn't a cook, you know. But they, they didn't have anybody else, so they gave me the job. <laughs> and we didn't have much boga. When I have to cook for the, the, the deities, we had the same boga every day. Cauliflower, potatoes, 
and peas, and eggplant, tomatoes, and bell peppers. So that, that was the only vegetables I ever made every day. So one day was cauliflower and potatoes, and sometimes with peas, and another day was eggplant, tomatoes, and sometimes with bell pepper. And I made these two vegetables for years. <laughs> so, and to this day, I can't eat any of that. <laughs> And then somebody went through the woods and found this thing that looked like asparagus, but it wasn't. It was, we used to call it, they used to call it pokeweed. It looked just like asparagus, but it was a kind of a, a vegetable that was locally grown there. And then we would make that. Hmm. And we make po pokeweed chutney, pokeweed sweets, pokeweed pakora, pokeweed soup. <laughs> Like that, so that's was yeah, that was our my days of cooking, which but I usually I really like to cook halava. Halava was my favorite to cook, but I was very traditional. I wouldn't put any extra things in it, simply farina, raisins, ghee, not ghee, but butter and sugar, that's all. And then somebody, they said Prabhupada liked it with, uh, not farina, but with, uh, what is that other grain? Cinnamon? Maybe. Blanca? It's, a, it's something a little different, but it's like, it's like halava. Mm. It's more Indian style. More traditional India. Farina, I think, came from the West. But hmm, I don't know what it was. Okay, I don't want to keep you. Tomorrow is the big day. Everyone should get up early and come to Samsara Dhavan Nalal Hitaloka so maybe we can all end here and uh, thank you very much for listening to these stories Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Prabhu Ki Jai <laughs>